everybody, Gary Main Brew Guy again with the second installment of So You Want to Open a Brewery. And uh, this is the part two of the planning stage. So we're going to pick up a little bit where we left off. I may recap a few things that um, on the previous video I didn't really clarify enough. But before we get started, I have a couple of dear friends, uh, Nick and Brandon of Exit 12 Homebrew. And uh, every year, uh, they've been brewing this, uh, now they call it thrice in a lifetime, which was twice in a lifetime. And then the original, I guess, was once in a lifetime. I believe I've had them all. Anyway, this um, they, they claim this is a barrel-aged imperial milk stout. It's 12%, so it's in the Russian imperial anyway. Also, they included uh, coffee beans as well. So I'm really pumped to try this beer out. And <clears throat> it was canned on 9-11-21. Nick seems uh, to think that these bigger beers should be drank fresh. So I think they should age and mellow a little. So we tend to disagree on that. So I know he's gonna be mad at me for having this beer so late. All right, here we go. Oh yeah, look at that. Big, big beer. It's got a dark brown color to it. Uh, it looks viscous. Uh, there's no real head, um, but it's hard to get a head on a 12% beer that's been barrel aged. There is um, some <laughs> big plums and raisins and um, dark fruits and just wafting off of this beer. So I'm pretty sure that there's some carbonation there. So let's let's dig in uh, with the nose. Yeah, just pretty much what I was uh, getting from afar. Yeah, a lot of the big uh, dark fruits, plums, raisins. Yeah, definitely some strong coffee notes there. A little bit of maybe even um, sort of that burnt character that you get on some of those dark malts. Not a negative, that's just the description. La Chaim. Mmm, okay, wow. So that has a lot more raisin and plums uh, on the profile when you when you drink it and then the coffee sort of follows in trailing there at the end very nice beer guys all right so I'll continue to sip on this I may add some commentary along the way back to why you came so where we left off on the last video uh, basically we were wrapping up the importance of a business plan the importance of trademarking and uh, I'm going to touch on the trademarking thing so when I first started home brewing, those of you who've known me, uh, I started out with uh, Ledge Brewing. That was my home brewery name. And then once I decided that I thought I might go pro at some point, I slowly tried to work out a name that I was going to use in the professional setting. And that's when I came out with Tap Out Brewing. And that's the, that's the name I, I intended to move forward with all along. So I trademarked Tap Out Brewing and then all hell broke loose. I uh, received um, a cease and desist order from the uh, Tap Out Fitness out of New York and they came with a lot of money and uh, it wasn't worth it to me uh, to try to fight that, even though mine was Tap Out Brewing and there's Tap Out Fitness. But that just goes to show you that, you know, trademarking your name is probably a thing that a lot of people don't do and they probably should do. Although, I think I came up with a better name that's more local, um, has more local appeal to it. Changed the name to Chubby Mermaid Brewing LLC. And so I'll talk about the LLC part in a moment, but basically trademark that, we're good to go. So, you know, website is up and uh, socials working on that. Also starting to get some merch like the shirt. Where I left off and I think that needs to be clarified a little more is we were talking about creating a budget and then getting your costs. Once you have a business name, then you can you know open an account in that name because you're gonna have an EIN number and then you're going to register your business as either a doing business as sole proprietor or you're gonna do a limited, low, um, uh, limited liability corporation like I did, or you're gonna be a full-blown corporation if you're gonna have partners and whatnot to start. Once you've decided the structure of your business, because now your name is trademarked, you're safe, here's the big to-do. A lot of the uh, vendors like BSG will not give you an account until you have a physical location. So it's really hard for you to get the cost of goods sold if you don't know what your true costs are. And 
it's hard to know what to budget for on the size of your building if you don't know how much you're making. So you're kind of caught in a circle there. So I think BSG does a really dis a big disservice to people trying to start out uh, their breweries. Work around. Uh, most states have a local or a state brewer's guild. Florida happens to have one as well. It's the Florida B Brewer's Guild. I recommend highly that you get involved with your, brewer, your local brewer's guild because there are brewers in this forum, in these forums, and they're able to help you. There's also, you would join as a brewery in planning like I am, and um, that way you, you can ask questions of, of other folks. Say, you know, hey, if you're, you're producing 600 barrels a year, how many days a week are you brewing? What are you finding your bottlenecks are? Blah, blah, blah. How much are you spending on electricity? Oh, by the way, can you send me the BSG price list? which they did promptly. I had received it within probably 10 minutes of asking, which allowed me to then be able to calculate my cost of goods sold accurately. Hats off to Yakima Valley Hops. Uh, they uh, created a commercial account for me right away without a physical location. So that was fantastic. So I could get my, uh, my hops cost of goods and I had my grain cost of goods and I um, had a pretty good idea how much my electricity would cost uh, to, to produce the beer and maintain the lights and the, the glycol and all of that constantly. So I have a pretty good understanding of what it's going to cost to produce a beer and how much it's gonna cost me per glass to produce a beer. It's not minus all the other things that have to be removed like payroll and credit card fees and you know, china and uh, silverware and pa pla paper plates and napkins and, you know, all the other things that go in uh, brewing, cleaning supplies. I mean, you just name that you have to think of everything and try to come up with a cost on these things. So you build those costs in and you build them in as a percentage, again, using a spreadsheet. So that's kind of the lesson learned there. Um, big, big uh, thing to do there is to, to get with the Brewer's Guild. Okay, so moving on. Let me take another sip here. Mm. Yeah, the carbonation is a tad low, but it, um, it drinks so well, it, I don't even care. So some of you might say, well, Gary, I don't really care about making a budget. I'm just gonna start making beer. That's, that's really good. Uh, if you wanna shoot from the hip, that's great, but um, <clears throat> you might want to know how much you need to brew to break even based on your overhead. And this is where your budget comes in. Whether you're going to the bank or not, it's really important that you have a firm understanding of what you need to do to make it succeed. I think that's very important. The next logical step is what size brewing equipment am I going to get? Based on the budget that you created, you'll know how much you have to produce every month, every year to hit your break even point and to make money. That will dictate the size of your system. Are you gonna start out with a one barrel, two barrel, three barrel? That's up to you. Depends on your overhead. There's a lot going on there, but it, and it's not a one size fits all. That's why you have to start with a budget to have a firm understanding how much things cost and how much you can make and how much you need to produce. Once you figure that out, then you can go shop around, find the equipment, purchase it. And that's what I did. I put a deposit down on equipment. It's a 3.5 barrel brew house. I'm using, to start out with, five um, 500 liter uh, fermenters, conical fermenters, jacketed glycol, and one bright tank. Later on, I'll probably move to a seven barrel conical glycol for some of the more house beers, the bigger turnover beers. Um, then I'll just have to do double brew days to fill it. So that's what I decided to do. So based on that, I now know my equipment size and footprint. Based on that, I know what size the brewery has to be. That square footage dictates a lot of things, right? So you need a refrigeration system, some sort of a walk-in cooler or whatever for your beers um, uh, that you have on tap, at least in the small setting, like, a, like probably most of us will start out in. The cooler itself is the tap wall. So you build a cooler, all your kegs go inside the cooler, you have a nice facade around the cooler, that, you know, whatever. And then your taps are popping through the wall of the cooler and on the opposite side are your kegs or your directly fed uh, lines from your conical fermenters. I've decided to go with RO water. So I'll use a 
Basically, it's in a whole house RO system with a 500 liter storage tank. I'm not gonna brew every day, I don't need to. So the storage tank will replenish probably every 24 hours. It's an all electric brewing system, three phase, 220 volt system is what I went with. I didn't go with gas. Um, so three phase power is another thing I had to consider when I'm looking for my location, which is the next thing. Now that you know the size of your brewery, you know the footprint, you know how many tables you want, you know how big your cooler is going to be, how big your bar is going to be, how many bar stools you want, etc., etc. Right? So you figure that out, you kind of get an idea what kind of footprint you need. Now you can start looking for a place. So for me, it was minimum of 1,800 square feet to 2,400 square feet, depending on the square footage price. When you're looking for a place to rent, there's the rent square footage, and then there's what's called CAMS. CAMS is usually six, seven, eight dollars, depending on where you are, additional to your rent. That is like, um, uh, it does all the maintenance around the facility, mowing the lawn, whatever, if you're up north plowing the dry, you know, plowing the parking lot, that kind of thing. Also, there's a portion of that that goes to the leasing agent every month. So they get their residual income from uh, listing their property rather, and then finding tenants, uh, viable tenants to fill them. That's their, how they get paid basically. Those two numbers combined will be your rent. So once you have your rent figured out, or what your cap is on your rent, then you will know what you can look for. But remember, you have that square footage that you have a minimum of 18, like for me, minimum 1800 and probably up to 2400 based on the price. I could go bigger, but the price would have to be much lower, right? So that's my cap. So knowing that, I know how many times I need to brew a week. Starting out, it's not that much. Once a week, sufficient with that size brew system. Great, now I've got the size of the place that I need. I have my equipment ordered, so now I need to find the location. Now here is the hardest part of all. They always tell you location, location, location in any business, right? Breweries are a little different because you know you've been to breweries that have been in industrial parks and uh, they're big warehouses, uh, out of the way, people still show up. So location, location, location isn't always the same thing for a brewery, although it does help. It's not end all be all, right? So you have to consider that too. What are you gonna do? Where are you gonna be? Are you gonna be in a warehouse setting? Um, you know, more open concept, picnic tables. You'll have to decide what kind of environment you want for your brewery and how you wanna have it. So I will say in most places, if you're not serving food, you can have dogs come in. But if you're serving food, dogs cannot be inside the brewery. They can be outside, but not inside. Just food for thought, pardon the pun. Mm. As this warms up, the raisins come out big time. It has that smell. You know when you, um, the, ra the raisins, um, you get a little box of raisins, can't think of the name, and you first peel that box open and you're about to shake it in your hand and you smell those raisins, uh, that sweetness and real strong raisin aroma. That's what I get on this. Once you've done looking at the locations, and then you have to find out if you're zoned. Zoned for brewing, zoned for alcohol, zoned for food if you're gonna do food. Third thing you have to look for when you're looking for a place is, is there an anti-compete clause? In other words, is there another restaurant in, the, in your complex that says, that said when they sign their lease, there will be no other restaurants in this plaza or no other breweries? So you have to find those things out too. Usually the leasing agent will have that information. Then you wanna get an electrician to come over and kind of inspect the area and make sure that you're not in for a lot of electrical expenditures out of the gate. That's what I did. One of the locations has three phase power there. It's perfect, saved myself $18,000. Bingo, love it. The other location, I don't think it does have three phase power there, but there the landlord is willing to work with me he said so i'm going on tuesday to find out what that means so there's a lot of that going on so for me i know my equipment won't be in until probably october november time frame so i'm in no real rush to find a location but i do need at least two to three months of construction time at the location setting up all the drops for the electricity for all the equipment uh, you know building the bar building the cooler uh, running the beer lines, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the you know, sound system, tables, chairs, and I'll document that as we go. 
So let's wrap up this session now. So this is the end of the planning stage. The next videos you see from me will be actually in the location that we've decided to go with and the construction. So the boring planning stuff is over. <laughs> Took a long time. This has been three months since the last video because there has been a lot of changes along the way and a lot of planning that's happened. It's a very fluid thing, uh, but I think I've got it pretty narrowed down now. With that being said, so once you've trademarked your business name, great, you're good to go, you know it's good, nobody's challenged it. Start moving forward with your domain names, all that stuff. Open up your bank account. Start trying to open up accounts. Sign up with your local Brewers Guild, I think it was 99 bucks a year, whatever. It's an invaluable source. And not only that, they're, they're always selling stuff. Like, I was on there, they were selling a used one barrel brew house. I mean, that would have been perfect for, you know, some if I was starting out on a really small space, like less than 1,200 square feet or whatever. It's a good place to, to you know, to hang your hat with $99 a year tax deduction, I suppose. And you can get a lot of information or the missing pieces of the puzzle there for your budget. All right, so you got your budget. Now you've figured out how much you need to brew, the size of your footprint, because now you've already decided on what kind of equipment you're gonna buy. So you know how tall the equipment is, how, how much headspace it needs. So now when you go look for a building and the ceilings are eight feet and you're like me with a 3.5 barrel brew house, not going to cut it. So that narrows your search even more. So you got to know those things before you start looking because you st let's give you a scenario. I go look for a place. I find a place. I realize after the equipment comes in, the ceiling's too low. What are you going to do? You're screwed at that point. You're absolutely screwed. So do your homework. Next thing, I get into location. I start setting up and I get uh, the building inspector comes by and says, hey, you're not zoned for alcohol here now what do you do you signed a three-year lease you're screwed so you got to check all those things if you at least get through those things you're probably going to be okay nothing is a um, uh, problem or error free I should say uh, but you know as we used to say in the army Semper Fi Gumby basically means just be flexible next installment will probably be us working inside the new space cheers guys thanks Nick and Brandon it's really good beer and don't be afraid to age this one buddy it's big beer cheers